patient. One, two, two, six. Cold, dead silence. That was all I ever heard in the hospital. I sat alone in the evaluation room, somewhere I knew all too well. While waiting for my regular doctor, I had taken the time to count the tiles on the floor and estimate the perimeter of the room. I listened to the occasional padding of people's feet in the hallway. I always knew the difference between a patient and a doctor. A doctor often sounded like the footsteps were rushed in light. A patient's were slow and heavy. The sound often lingered until the next step was taken. I mentally compared them to my own. I then heard the doorknob click and the heavy iron door opened. Sashta? A soft female voice said as she entered, closing the door behind her. I looked over, away from staring at nothing in the direction of the wall in front of me. Dr. Ramos, I said, my eyes following her as she sat across from me at the table, just in the center of the evaluation room. The walls were roughly four feet thick. Nobody could hear from the hallway or the room next to it. But even still, I could hear through the door. I suppose I was just used to trying to tune into something to draw out the ringing in my ears from the silence of the room. Dr. Ramos was a beautiful woman. She was thin with slightly tan skin and dark brown hair, a color that matched her eyes. She always had her hair either tied back in a long ponytail or a round bun. This particular day, she had the bun look going. She looked through my stuffed files from the previous days. I remember when I asked about them, and she said she was instructed to record everything that went on in this room. Even I figured that that had to be terribly boring. Are you ready to begin, Sashta? She asked me gently. I glanced over at the documents and my general profiles, not even half aware of the things in those. Now, how do you feel today? Fine. I answered with no emotion. I never really answered differently. For a while, I was suspected as suicidal or something because I would answer this and then supposedly act differently to the other questions. To me, that was stupid. But I answered this because it was true. I was always generally fine. Dr. Ramos took a moment to write myself listening to the scribbles like always. I could tell when she was either writing in cursive or print. If she was writing in cursive, the scribbles had a straight flow and periodically stopped for punctuation. Print was usually about three seconds of scribbling, then stop, then start again. I never had to glance at the paper to know. Any feeling of nausea? Headaches? Is your anxiety getting any better? I nodded slowly, not really paying too much attention to her. I had been suffering slight anxiety as of that time, and she prescribed me a pill to take, and she ran it through the hospital's pharmacy to deliver to my room when I needed it. The spells were not too horrible but it sometimes caught me off guard, to say the least. And have you been sleeping all right? Dr. Ramos asked. I rolled my eyes at her and looked her in the eyes. She always asked me this, a question she knew the answer to already. I don't sleep, Dr. Ramos, I told her. She shook her head a little. 
I've seen you sleep, Sasha. It is rare, yes, but I know you do. Well, I don't really sleep, I responded with a slight snap. I just go into a state of unawareness, and then I come back about an hour later. Ever since I got here, I trailed off. I had not had a decent amount of sleep in nearly a year. This damned hospital was sure to be the death of me. I knew it. Dr. Ramos just nodded slowly. She was like every other doctor here. They never really take the patients like me seriously, but rather take our words with a grain of salt. I guess it's because they all think of us that as patients, we just know everything, when really, most of us are just waiting to see if they will really listen and help, or just generally try to push us to the point of no return. I have seen a patient or two like that in the time I had been there. I wondered if I would end up with their fate. Well, let's see if you're up to talking about why you're here in the first place, hmm? Dr. Ramos finally said about after five minutes of straight scribbling. I returned to resting my head on my hand and I allowed a sigh to slip through my lips. <sighs> What's the use? Every time you do this, I tell you the same thing. I know nothing. Sasha, she began. You and I both know that you're still dealing with the trauma you experienced. I know that losing your brother was hard on you. He's happy now, I simply remarked. How stupid. They always play the sympathy card pretending to be on your side for about 10 minutes before getting to the root of the reason you are sitting in a mental institution. I'm not worried, Ramos. Dr. Ramos looked at me with pure annoyance, which I found a crude humor in. I hid it behind a straight face, but I was mentally smirking. So your parents were killed in a car accident when you were 12, right? Yes. Your brother was about 18 and was the only family you had. I nodded. Other than my senile grandmother in the nursing home, yes. It was always questions and answers. I could recite like a script. Every single question she asked me each day was almost always the same. And you lived with your brother until you were about 16. And then the incident occurred. I nodded. I began to feel a little uncomfortable with the conversation at this point. I always did. See, I cared a lot about my brother. He was the nicest guy anyone could ever know. Derek was really the best sibling I could ask for. But he suffered a lot since our parents died. He dropped out of college for me and just took up a job with the closest convenience store. It was a shame, really. Do you remember what happened that night, Sashta? Dr. Ramos asked me. I bit my lip out of anxiety. I glanced around the room as I began to repeat the story. He came home from work one day. He looked upset and tired. Rebecca, his girlfriend of seven years, had just broken up with him the day before, and I knew he was at his breaking point. He began to smoke a lot more than he had been, and then that's when he started drinking. I wanted to trail off and stop at this point, but every time, Dr. Ramos would somehow find a way to push me. I did not want to keep reliving it all, not like this. And when he began drinking again, I, I don't want to talk anymore. Sasha, please, Dr. Ramos begged me. I felt something like anxiety pulse through me and I glanced down at my lap. My hands were folded, and I had been twiddling my thumbs. 
You will never get better if you always stop in the middle of your story. I said I'm done. This was a normal thing, unfortunately for me. Can I just go back to my room? No, Sashta. You have to keep going. How can I help you if you don't tell me what happened? I want to scream, cry, anything. I guess this is what people would call having a panic attack. I just wanted out of there and away from that doctor. I felt sick to my stomach. P please, just, I just want to go back to my room. I pleaded, my voice shaking. I think my face flushed by then because I almost felt the contents of my stomach come back up my throat. Sasha, I need you to- No! I ended up vomiting all over myself, but the rest is blurry. I think I remember Dr. Ramos getting on her radio and calling for more doctors to come and help me. God. Not again. When I came to, I was back in my room. One of the doctors had managed to change my scrubs for me, and I sat up in my bed slowly. I think my roommate was in an evaluation room too, unless she was getting therapy again. This always happens. I cannot ever get better because I always have some kind of attack before I can get to my subconscious and spit out my story. I knew what I did, but I never admitted it out loud. I guess I'm just not meant to ever get better. What's the use in being in a psych ward if I cannot get better? I looked out the window, the setting sun the only thing illuminating my room. I got up and I looked down, remembering that I was on the third story. I began to wonder, maybe. Just maybe, I could get away. This ward is built a little ways away from a forest, and that alone aligns with the main road. I could maybe get somewhere away from here. I knew if I jumped, it would be a leap of faith. It was then I remembered the roll of gauze I kept in my bedside table. I hurried over to it, opened the drawer, and retrieved it. As I went back to the window, I began to rethink to myself, can I do this? I eyed the window, which had widely set bars. Some people probably could not get through, but thanks to me losing an excessive amount of weight since I've been here, I could easily slip past. Cautiously, I climbed up the windowsill, carefully squeezed through the bars, and had a death grip as I looked down. I knew I would have to be careful. I hoped I would land on my feet. I said a quick prayer before jumping. Sure enough, I did land on my feet, but I did not go uninjured. I felt and heard a dull crunch in my left ankle, causing me to stumble. I wanted to scream, but I bit my lip to hold back. I did not believe it was broken, but it was probably fractured. I used my gauze to quickly and sloppily wrap it up. The pain was immense, but I ran in the direction of the woods. I guess I was not as stealthy as I thought. I soon heard guards yelling at me, calling for me to come back. I heard one get on the radio to report I had escaped. I could hear rapid footsteps behind me, and I tried to go faster, but my injury held me back, and I fell forward, my face hitting the ground roughly. I felt two sets of men's hands grab me and drag me back to the psych ward. I screamed, kicked, and even bit to try and get them to let me go, but it was to no avail. When I realized they were not just going to take me back to my room, I began to scream even louder. They were taking me to the therapy room. They threw me in and locked the door behind me. I had fallen to the floor, and once I staggered up, I pounded on the door. I knew what was coming. One of the professionals was going to ice bathe me. 
I let out another scream of rage before hitting the door again with my fists. I turned around, expecting to see a bathtub and another door for the professional to come through. But to my surprise, there was nothing. The room was empty. What? What was this? I began to feel my anxiety act up again, and I wanted to be sick. I looked up, hoping to find something that could get me out of here. Something burned inside of me when I noticed a security camera. Once I noticed it, I heard a voice come over on an intercom. Patient number 1226, Sasha Joanne Gordon. Isolation test commencing. Welcome, patient 1226. What? Get me the fuck out of here! Dr. Ramos! I had hoped someone would reply to me. What was this even for? I was horrified to say the absolute least. I felt my stomach drop and I ended up getting sick again. When I finished, I wiped my mouth with my sleeve. Then I looked back up at the camera. <laughs> I hope you're enjoying the show, motherfucker! Do you think this will really work? Dr. Ramos asked her colleague next to her. He glanced to her, then back at the monitor, showing patient 1226 in the isolation room. Are you sure this is the right patient? He asked. Positive. She's been my patient for nearly a year now. She opened one of Sasha's files and showed the doctor her file. He read it, occasionally glancing back up at the monitor to check everything. 16 years old, blonde hair, green eyes, pale skin. This was the right girl. Allegedly, she is responsible for the murder of Derek Keaton Gordon, she added. And she isn't in the criminally insane wing, why? The doctor asked, raising a brow at Dr. Ramos. Because the authorities could not prove she did it. He had so much alcohol in his system, it was hard to tell what killed him. His liver was nearly deteriorated, not to mention his lungs were blacker than night itself. What makes him think it was murder? Just the way everything was set up, it's like Michael Jackson's death. Nearly everyone believes it was murder, but nobody can prove it for sure. Not to mention she refuses to talk about it. It's like every time she does, she gives herself an anxiety attack. The doctor sighed and looked back to the monitor. Well, the isolation will hopefully make her admit to something, or at least get her to calm down. We need to change her room so she can't escape again. Dr. Ramos nodded and looked back to the monitor. Sashta had given up and was sitting in a corner, hugging her knees to her chest and trying to make herself breathe. Admittedly, Dr. Ramos felt somewhat remorseful for doing this to her patient, but they needed something. She refused to believe she was unfixable. She was not going to give up on this girl.